Last year in America, three and a half million people didn't have a place to sleep and were considered homeless. That includes 1.5 million children who didn't have a place to call home. These are kids like six-year-old Maria, who has two little sisters, a backpack, and a pencil, but no bed. Homelessness is defined as sleeping in places not meant for human habitation. Most people without homes either sleep outside, in their cars, or in homeless shelters. I think we can all agree that sleeping outside or in your car are not places meant for human habitation. But I'm going to argue that most of our traditional homeless shelters are also not places meant for human habitation. Brain research shows us that the kinds of shelters most of our communities have actually make it harder for the people who stay there to get out of homelessness. I'm here to share there's a better way to shelter using trauma-informed design and architecture. For the last 12 years, I've been the executive director of a nonprofit that operates shelters for homeless families with children. I've worked with thousands of people without homes, and I have seen how hard homelessness can be on a person and a family. I've also seen how our traditional homeless shelters make things worse for the people who stay there. To understand why this is, let's take a look at some brain science, which helps us understand what goes on in the brain when someone experiences something as stressful as homelessness. You see, when anyone's brain is exposed to any stress, the brain releases chemicals to help us get through that stress. If it's positive, motivating stress, like buying a new home or finals week at school, the brain releases chemicals that promote emotional regulation, critical thinking, and logical thought, all very good things that get you through stress. But when it's negative stress, the brain releases different chemicals that put you into what I call survival mode because it focuses on making sure you just survive whatever stress you're confronted with. When you're in survival mode, the chemical reaction turns off your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's responsible for all of our uniquely human brain functions. Things like critical thinking and comprehension, logic and rationality. You don't have these things available to you in survival mode because your prefrontal cortex is unplugged and offline. Even if you tried really hard, this chemical reaction would prevent you from bringing it back online. You're left in survival mode, the fight, flight, or freeze system that leaves you on high alert, ready for danger. Survival mode is really helpful, say, when you're in the wild and you see a lion. Survival mode helps you get ready to fight that lion or run away from that lion to protect yourself and save your life. But survival mode is also triggered in response to stress like domestic violence and homelessness. Losing your home causes you to have the same brain reaction that confronting a lion in the wild does. And when you experience homelessness for several weeks, months, or even years, your brain stays in survival mode that whole time. Survival mode stops being momentarily life-saving like when that lion's running at you, and it starts being maladaptive. It turns into a trauma, where the brain is so overwhelmed with stress chemicals like cortisol and adrenaline that it starts to rewire itself into being in a constant stress response. Even when there's nothing to be afraid of, the brain is hypervigilant about scanning the environment to find where that danger might come from next. As a result of this hypervigilant survival mode, you experience slowed thinking. You have a hard time making decisions and you just can't concentrate. You can only understand every third word said to you. You have a hard time sleeping and you can't regulate your emotions. Sometimes you have outbursts at the tiniest things and other times, just to get away from the stress and anxiety in your head, you emotionally detach and become indifferent. And it's not because you're a bad parent or a stupid person. It's because your brain is releasing chemicals that keep you in this hypervigilant state, always looking for that dangerous lion. Survival mode leads to negative health outcomes. When you experience prolonged survival mode, you're more likely to get lung cancer, hepatitis, and lung disease like COPD. You're four times as likely to be depressed and you're 12 times as likely to commit suicide. 
eventually prolonged exposure to survival mode leads to early death. The average life expectancy of someone who is homeless is only 49 years old. One would hope that going into a homeless shelter would help stop this survival mode and help us get back on to our thinking parts of our brains. But that isn't what happens. Our traditional homeless shelters actually make this stress response worse because they're set up in messy and chaotic ways that just exacerbate the stress and anxiety in the brain. Shelters are often in warehouses with long rows of cots on the floor, leaving people without any dignity or privacy. Shelters have rigid expectations that make people feel powerless and controlled. There are long lists of rules that people are supposed to read, understand, and follow, even though survival mode prevents them from having things like reading comprehension and impulse control available to them. People can't get a job or be able to get back into housing because their thinking part of their brain is literally turned off. These folks that we sometimes just assume are lazy and not even trying to help themselves are actually being prevented from helping themselves because they're in survival mode and our messy, chaotic shelters are making things worse. I'm here to share there's a better way to shelter. There's a way to provide shelter that actually helps people get out of survival mode and back into the thinking parts of their brain. And what if I told you the key to getting people out of survival mode was in the walls and the ceiling. That's right, the built environment, the architecture and design of a place can literally change the chemical reaction in the brain, helping you to think logically and understand the world again. That way you can actually understand and follow the shelter rules, you can benefit from the services that shelter wants to provide, and you can make the kinds of change you wanna see in your life. A better way to shelter. Trauma-informed shelters are beautiful places that make you feel good when you walk in. They build dignity and restore power. They have room for flexible spaces where tots, teens, pets, and adults can all be themselves. The trauma-informed design features the color palette of the ocean, blues, greens, and turquoises with little color contrast. We feature round forms and curved spaces that bring a sense of uplift and positivity. There's privacy and solitude if desired, but there's also space to be in community and build relationships. There's a strong sense of abundance and a connection to nature through natural plants, woods, and natural materials. These design elements create an environment where just by being in the physical shelter building, people start to have more access to the logical thinking part of their brain. So what if we stopped designing shelters as rows of cots on the floor, which we know put people in survival mode and lead to negative health outcomes and can eventually result in death, and started designing shelters using trauma-informed design and architecture? Initial research shows that trauma-informed design produces better outcomes for shelters. Things like shorter shelter stays and greater success moving into housing. We could create a movement in this country where we change the way one of our most basic social services is provided to a way that actually helps people heal from the crisis and trauma of homelessness and make changes for the better in their lives. But it doesn't just have to stop at shelters. The principles of trauma-informed design and architecture can be applied anywhere, especially places we experience stress. Doctor's offices, schools and universities, our homes. We could start to create spaces that promoted positive brain functioning and started to help all of us better deal with our stress. A better way to shelter, a better way to live. Thank you. <laughs>